me ask you this. Is Dr. Hall's take on the energy situation, is that a political position? Or is it a scientific position? Science. Science? Horace thinks it's science. Yes, sir. Excuse me? Both? Both? Yes, ma'am. I think it's science, but you're not, it's also political, but you're not expressing it directly. It has, oh, good, I like, I, I mean, if, I, if that's what you think in hearing me and reading me, perhaps, then that's good. Because as a scientist, it's not my business, I don't believe, to have a political position. As a citizen, it is, and certainly as a citizen, sometimes I speak out, and if I, I've testified in Congress and so forth, and when I do that, then I try to give my point of view about what something might mean, not simply the facts, but some of the implications. But uh, I don't think it's the business of a scientist to do science to support a position. This is a difficult thing for many of you young people, many of you have very strong environmental feelings to come to grips with. Many people think you do science to support a position. That's reality. My view is you do science to try to understand the reality, how the world works, what the basic concepts are, um, whatever the science, and, and to test hypotheses, of course, from which might be derived either by you or others separately a political position. But you must be very careful that you, you do it on an editorial page, so to speak, or to say, my opinion of the importance of this is as follows, as opposed to the best of my knowledge, the facts are thus. Well, what do you think? Are we Easter <coughs> Island? What would be a good argument that we are not Easter Island? Yes? We understand the situation. Oh, you, you think we do? Well, are we operating as if we do? Huh? Notice how we have put restrictions on SUVs these days, huh? But yes, you in this room understand the situation, perhaps. Okay, that was one of mine. Maybe we come up with a technological savior. What's the big technological savior that we came up with? Nuclear power. Is that still a possibility? Okay. Boy, I'm going to have cause some of you to write me off forever. As an, as an ecologist, I tend to favor nuclear power, if done right. Because it's clean, if done right. Got some problems, though. But the technology you think, and I guess I think too, isn't that what the whole course is about, the e evolving technology of humans, got us into the problem. And everybody thinks technology is going to get us out. Interesting. Well, we've got to get on with today's lecture, but Horace, you got one more comment? Yeah, I was thinking, why couldn't you use solar power instead of using it? Uh, the difference is this. Um, on a good hot day, I'd like you to hold your hand up to the sun. And on a good, on any day, I'd like you to hold your hand over a Bunsen burner. Pretty big difference in energy concentration, right? That's the issue. It's pretty hard to collect enough solar power, and if you do, it takes an enormous amount, amount of energy intensive materials to collect it to get the intensity you get out of burning a lump of coal or, or some oil or some, um, some gas. That's the problem, <coughs> except for windmills. I like windmills. Windmills work. Yeah. Um, this is just something that you might add to it. I don't know if you've it's heard an, it. You understand, solar, a windmill is solar power. The sun differentially heats the earth. Yeah, go ahead. Um, one of my friends converted his car to an engine that runs off of vegetable oil. What's the problem with that? Dr. Pimentel is the expert on that. Uh, for example, in Congress now, there's all this legislation that supports uh, making methanol or ethanol, it's methanol too, from corn to run cars. Great, all we gotta do is grow our energy, right? Well, that's not, a, well, I mean, that's just 
That would be if everybody were to get it. I mean, he happens to get everything for free just because... Yeah, of course, he subsidizes if he gets it for free. What's the problem with it? Well, as it is now, you can't grow enough corn to produce enough energy. Yeah, this is total energy use in the United States now, fossil energy use. Dr. Pimentel did this work. He's coming on Wednesday. Don't miss Wednesday. This is the total photosynthesis starting on the floor. This is total photosynthesis in the United States. It's less than our total energy use. So you have to plow over the entire United States. And basically what we do is we use fossil fuel to make fertilizers, run tractors, make irrigation and so forth to get food and fiber. And so it's a little crazy to think about using food and fiber to get fossil fuels because the food and fiber is more valuable. I mean, oil is, is valueless until you use it. Right. Well, I, okay, wait, wait. in fact, I didn't quite answer this question. So here's something by ADM. You know who ADM is? Big political contributor. And what did they get from their contribution? I better, this is a little bit political, I better not say that. But what did they get for that? They got Congress to vote for uh, giving a subsidy to make um, alcohol for fuel from corn. My friend Robert Herendine at the University of Illinois, who's an expert on all such energy matters, says, did analyses, and he said, when you're all done, when you look at the energy it takes to grow and distill corn into a fuel, including the fertilizer, the tractors, and everything else, it takes about one calorie or one liter of oil to make one liter of alcohol in your car. It's uncomfortably close to one for one. Now, to run a civilization, you have to have an energy return on investment of probably 10 to 1, just at a guess. To be rich, you have to have higher than that. Everybody can do anything you want to feel good. I want to solve the problem nationally and, and globally. That's tough. So do what you want that makes you feel good. So what do ESF students do? They sort their garbage, they eat rice and beans, they uh, ride their bicycle or walk to work, and they save enough money so that they can go take a trip to Costa Rica over break. Have they saved any energy? No. It's their choice. Maybe they've gotten more social utility out of the money they spent and hence the energy they spent, right? So, unfortunately, that's the problem. Everybody does these little things and they save money. If you save money and then you go spend it, especially if you spend it on a trip, which is mostly what college students do, you haven't, you haven't saved any energy. But maybe it's better to have you go down and take a look at Costa Rica, which is what we are going to do today. We are going to talk about Costa Rica today. So, let's start with the slides. Make it happen. <laughs> Okay, we want to talk today, over here now, we want to talk today about one of the most important environmental problems, I would say, as it affects average people around the world. And what we want to talk about is what we call the developing world. We are the rich world, the industrialized north. You guys may not think so because your students, you are filthy rich compared to most people in the world. You get up in the morning, you take a hot shower, you've used more energy than probably half to two-thirds of the people in the world on that day already. So, what, how the environment affects, wait, I'm sorry, sorry. How the environment affects people all around the world, most directly is in the quality of food that they have, whether they have an adequate diet, Inadequate means not simply enough calories, although that's very important. It also means enough protein, enough vitamins, enough all the things that the human body needs to operate well. If you look at the uh, production of cereal grains, about half the food, maybe more than 60% of the food consumed in the world, and about 60% or in a poor country, 90% of the food that people will eat will be cereal grains. Cereal grains principally means corn, more properly called maize, um, rice, and wheat. 
that constitutes about half or 60% maybe of all the food consumed in the world. So if we look at cereal production, cereal grain production, uh, there's, there's some other less important cereal grains too. They're basically grasses. They're C4 plants. They grow very fast. And humans have exploited them well, as we've learned in our lectures about the origin of agriculture. Humans have exploited these well in our cultural history that have enabled people to become abundant, uh, build cities, and so forth. Now, this looks pretty good, right? From 1961, which is basically when all the data becomes available, up to 1995, and these trends are continuing, then there has been a, a pretty much regular increase in the production of cereal grains. Now, what has caused this increase in the production of cereal grains? Well, during this period, there has been almost no increase in the hectares, the land area that's in agricultural production. Virtually all of the increase has come from increasing yields on each hectare. The increasing yields on each hectare, in turn, are principally a consequence of nitrogen fertilizer. Now, you, many people say, whoa, 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 it's technology. Well, yes, indeed, it is technology but it is the technology to allow us to use more fertilizers. The technology that allow for short stemmed rice, so if, if their yields are, their heads are bigger, the seeds are bigger, they don't fall over uh, and, and go to the bacteria that way. So, uh, the other thing, most food technology, most agriculture technology has been to do this is to increase what's called the yield proportion of the plants. If you look at, for most European crops, barley and wheat and so forth, the, the total growth of the plant has been a constant since about 1900. But the growth of the proportion that we eat has increased from about 30% to about 60%. Let me give you my ecological interpretation of that. As we have learned, a plant has to do many things with its maintenance metabolism. It has to find nutrients, it grows roots to do that. It has to get water, it grows roots to do that. It has to build structure so it's not shaded. Well, it builds stems and tree trunks to do that. Uh, it has to protect itself from insects. And it generates what are called secondary compounds. We talked about the alkaloids and some people's favorite plants. For example, that protect the plant from insect attack. It's in coffee and tea. It's why when you chew on oak leaves, it doesn't taste very good. So these are secondary compounds that protect the plants and they cost the plant energy. Now what agriculture breeders have been doing over time has been to breed the plants so that they, so that the things that the plant used to do for itself, that all wild plants must do for themselves, are done increasingly externally with fossil energy in human labor. You got that? This has allowed the plant breeders to breed plants for greater and greater yield. They have the same production, we haven't changed that very much, maybe a little with corn, but we put more and more of it into the part that we eat, and we do increasingly the things that the plant must do, protect itself from insects, get nutrients, get water, and so forth. We do it with external sources of these things. We put on fertilizer, we irrigate it, we do the things for the plant so the plant can put more of its total production into the seeds, into the parts that we eat. And this is the agricultural revolution. This has allowed us to increase total plant production. We can't increase plant production very much around the world anymore because all the good land has been used. There's lots of land left, but it's not very good land for agriculture. That's the biggest problem. And that was a problem that this guy, Ricardo, one of the early economists that we talked briefly about, thought about especially well. 
I, I wrote a, a, a paper a couple of years ago called Ricardo Lives, uh, implying that you know what he said back then is still taking place now. As we move to lower and lower quality land, the average yields decline. The best land in river bottoms and so forth will have high yields, but as you go up the slopes or up towards the head of the rivers, the average yields tend to go down. Ricardo noticed this without the benefit of modern science 200 years ago. Now, what's also happened during this time, of course, has been that, that the human population has continued to grow. So at first, the food production per capita increased, but since then has leveled off or perhaps even decreased. Now, it depends upon what part of the world you look at. Of course, we got tons of food, lots and lots of food here, no problem in the US. But in the world as a whole, per capita food production has been, which had been going up for so long, has beginning begun to saturate, I mean become flat, and even we think decline. So that's a problem. What does this mean in the developing countries of the world? Now another basic piece of information you need to think about is this graph here. Um, this is site quality. It simply means how good intrinsically is the place you're putting your seeds, how good is it for growing plants. So uh, putting in no fertilizers and, and no tractors and so forth, just, just for doing it with um, hand or horse labor, you might get one ton per hectare, that'll feed two people, maybe two and a half people, or three, two or three or four or five tons per hectare. Those are common yields. A hectare is two and a half acres. So it takes about an acre to feed a person if the, all they eat is the cereal, roughly. Um, if you can, however, increase yields by increasing the input of fertilizers, pesticides, tractor horsepower, irrigation, but most importantly, nitrogen fertilizer. Now, we may not like industrial agriculture, but we must realize something. From at least some perspective, it works. It generates more food per hectare. And that's allowed total global food production to continue to increase over time. Another important issue is one of saturation. If fertilizer is the most important way we increase crop yields, can we simply keep adding more and more fertilizer? Well, there are many, many studies that show this. This is just one example from uh, the United Nations. Uh, for different crops. This is for maize, for rice, and for wheat, and this is putting them all together. And what we find here is that there are indications that all of them are beginning to or have saturated. That somewhere around between 200 and 400 kilograms, kilogram is 2.2 pounds, so somewhere around a ton of fertilizer per hectare, which would be 400 pounds, more or less 400 pounds an acre of fertilizer, it doesn't help to add any more fertilizer. You just add more fertilizer, all you're doing, it just runs down the, the hillside and goes into the stream, causing all kinds of problems that Dr. Pimentel will talk about. So, it was easy for us to increase food production up until around 1990. It's getting tougher because we are approaching the limits of what you can do with fertilizer, or at least it seems that way. Now, will genetic, genetic engineering bring in a whole new type of technology? I don't know. It's not showing up in, in the general data yet. Uh, maybe that's possible. This is the yield tons per ton of fertilizer over time. We used to put in a ton of fertilizer, this happens to be Greece, and get about 90 tons of yield. Now in Greece, we put in a ton and we get around 15 or 20 tons yield. It's become less efficient. That's a consequence mathematically of this saturation. You can do the math in your head, you can see 
how it works. So this is happening all around the world. Next. Now, the reason I got interested in this, I was working in Costa Rica, I was working on carbon problems, tropical deforestation, the amount of carbon going into the atmosphere, you've all heard about that kind of stuff, right? So I was down there working on that, but uh, when I was down there in uh, the mid-1970s, when we were having lines at the gas pump in the United States, so-called energy crisis, big deal crisis, but so-called energy crisis, when you see what's coming down the road. Um, I was amazed at the impact on Costa Rica, and I said, why is this? Now, you know where Costa Rica is? Costa Rica is in Central America, just north of Panama, south of Nicaragua. Just a couple of facts about Costa Rica. It's a, a wonderful, wonderful country. It's probably a much better democracy than the United States. People have a higher literacy rate. They have better health statistics. They live longer. All, they, all kinds of things about Costa Rica are wonderful in the part of the world where often there's, there's some problems. It's a wonderful place. You all know it's a wonderful place for biologists to go. Now, what happened in Costa Rica is that when the price of oil increased, which is these squares, in 1973 and again in 79, the price of fertilizers went through the roof. So this is NP and K fertilizer also jumped up. And it killed Costa Rican farmers. And I said, why is that? Then I went in and I, I found out in Costa Rica, which we think of as a, some kind of agricultural wonder place, that they use more fertilizers per hectare per year in Costa Rica than we used in the United States. And I said, how can that be? So I began to wonder about this and it ended up doing all kinds of research in Costa Rica and I'm going down there and living there for a while and I, I recently published this book uh, called Quantifying Sustainable Development, The Future of Tropical Economies. Um, I, I wanted to call it the myth of sustainable development but conservative old academic press wouldn't buy that title but anyway. Uh, and it's really asking issues about sustainability and what I found about Costa Rica, the plug for my book. Hey everybody, buy my book. Um, what I found about Costa Rica, oh, I, have a, I have a review if anybody wants to see it. <laughs> what I found about Costa Rica was a Costa Rica with a per capita income of about $3,000 must be considered an industrialized country. <clears throat> And in fact, all the more I began to understand this, and I've done all kinds of work, I'm, I'm sort of a tropical e ecologist, so I travel all around the tropics. What I understand is that the tropics is just as heavily industrialized as is the United States or Britain or Germany. But it's different. They don't have fuel resources. They're dependent upon industrial products, but they don't make them. So that's the basic problem facing Costa Rica. And here is the basic point of this lecture. Already there are too many people in Costa Rica to feed them without industrial inputs. But in order to buy the industrial inputs, they must grow coffee and bananas and other things or bring in tourists that all of which requires an enormous amount of energy. So, in an enormous amount of fertilizer, for example, to make coffee. And then you have to grow coffee to pay for the fertilizer you put on the coffee or on the bananas. And in order to get the foreign exchange, the dollars, that you can then buy fertilizer to put on your rice and beans. And if you don't put fertilizer on your rice and beans, then you can't support the three and a half or four million people that are living there now. You're stuck. Now let's see how this plays out. So really the issue comes down to something people don't like to talk about except Dr. Bartlett, is population growth. 
there is not enough good land even to feed the people that are there now, and the population continues to grow exponentially. Uh, this is what we think of as tropical deforestation. Indeed, this, uh, this is in Brazil. Uh, huge areas being cleared, and leaving landscapes that look like this. None of us like that, of course, except maybe the people who did it. We also hear a lot about logging. Uh, this is one of the last mahoganies, as far as I can tell, to come out of uh, Royal Mahogany coming out of uh, Costa Rica. I took this picture in 1977. We don't see it anymore. They're all gone. Now they've gone through all the mahogany in uh, uh, Bolivia. The, but that's one of the last places of Belize. So mahogany is being sucked up around the world. So uh, corporate Enron can have mahogany paneled boardrooms and so forth, which can make better decisions about how to help us all, right? Costa Ricans are wonderful, fun-loving people. It's a great place to visit. They like Americans. Uh, that guy, I just went by and he's uh, just out there dancing around, you know, having a wonderful time all by himself. So I asked to take his picture and he called his wife in and uh, they're all <laughs> great folks. Now, how traditionally do people in the tropics make their living? They make it through what's called shifting cultivation. We barely talked about it. It's going to come up again and again. This is a way you can make you're living in the tropics with a minimal input from, <coughs> from the industrial world, probably just a machete, and a lot of input from nature. So you take a forest that's there, a natural forest, you cut it down, you allow the trees to dry out. As often this is done in very sophisticated ways. Now there are nutrients in these trees. That's the key. You burn it, <coughs> leaving behind a nutrient-rich ash. That's your fertilizer. Carlos comes along here with his dibble stick or digging stick and a bag of seeds and gets very good yields. You, you can get one and a half tons commonly in Central America. And this is the common, what so-called three sisters in all of the Americas, maize, and, and spiraling up the maize, here, some here, is uh, beans. Beans fix nitrogen, supplies nitrogen fertilizer, and squash. And squash are prickly, and, and, and so that many of the animals that don't like to walk on squash, so the squash protects uh, the beans from being eaten by animals that are looking for protein themselves. And you can see all the remnants of the forest are here. This is called shifting cultivation. Uh, and it's called shifting because it moves around. Here's a recent, on uh, the landscape, here's a recent area cut. Here's an area probably in production. Um, here are some areas that are probably recovering. See human trails uh, on the landscape. <coughs> if you look carefully, you can see where the, the forest is growing back. And so this is the only kind of agriculture that we know that's truly sustainable. And Dr. Pimentel says the only sustainable agriculture we have is shifting cultivation. For all other agriculture, the question is only how fast do you want to titrate out your soils and your fossil fuels? Remember I told you it takes about a gallon a day to feed each of you with our industrial agriculture. Now, this works very well but it's quite really now, and it was traditional in Costa Rica, but now it's very rare. There's a little bit, a few uh, plots that I took on very steep areas, very poor areas for farming. Nobody likes to walk on slopes that steep, but a very poor person probably lives here and is trying to get enough to feed his family out of this little patch here. Um, Here's a, a field, I took this picture in 1977, I thought it was going to be shifting cultivation. But in fact, what it is, um, it's getting out of focus. Uh, what it is, is an area, I've been watching this uh, plot now for about uh, 25 years, and it's been in cult, continuous cultivation. So Costa Rica has gone from shifting cultivation, which was traditional, to continuous <coughs> cultivation, and how do they do that? Well, of course, they do it with agrochemicals, which they must purchase because they can't make them in their country. They don't have the fossil fuels. They don't have 
Well, they have hydropower, but they don't have enough energy resources uh, to do this. Now, here's some good volcanic soil, and it looks like some cabbages. This is high elevation, uh, and I don't know what some of the other crops are here, but um, a lot of pastures. Uh, you get, it's good agriculture, and you might get about two tons per hectare, uh, probably less with cabbages, but pretty decent yields. If you look at the whole landscape of Costa Rica, you see that it's all, every square meter virtually, of the good land is being used. And it has been used for quite a long time. So here we have somebody's house, and he's got some kind of tree crop here. There's some beans in the foreground. There's some uh, coffee plants, I think, there. Growing a little coffee to get a little money. Maybe buy some fertilizer, looks like. Maybe some corn down there. Uh, probably some bananas. Um, here's a, a rich guy who owns his best land down in the river bo bottom. It looks like he's got some of it in pasture. And then we got a town that's growing up everywhere. And you see lots and lots of smoke, but it isn't shifting cultivation. It's just farmers cleaning up. These fields are in cultivation year after year after year. The main reason shifting cultivators abandon their field is because it's, it, it, they get too many insects. So what do they do? It's pesticides. Well, they work for a while. Here's coffee, here's sugar cane, some large-scale production, but most of it, the production is smaller, as we'll see. Some pastures and some new coffee plants here. Um, here's coffee from the top of the mountain way down to the bottom of the mountain. This area has been in continuous co coffee cultivation for 100 years. Every time it rains, the streams look like chocolate milk because, as you can see, there's a lot of exposed soil. The soil but the soil is very deep. The nutrients in some of the surface soils goes out with the rain, so they put on more with fertilizers. And that's what they do. Uh, any new land that's being developed now is being developed on land that grandpa would never have thought anybody in their right mind would ever have used for agriculture. But this is the only land that's left. You can see this is good dark soil. Probably going to get decent yields from there, but I'm watching while this guy's plowing and the oxen keep falling off because it's a very difficult place to work. But that's what's left. Uh, here's three guys, very friendly guys, and they're doing their little backyard plot here. Good volcanic soil, but you see their bags of fertilizer, and that's what they're doing. They're out there spreading fertilizer, even at small scale and at large scale. Uh, here, and what's happening is the towns are growing up on this area. This is where Grandpa built his house on the flattest land. That's where he wanted to farm. So if Grandpa was a farmer, he was the only one there. And then his kids, everybody loved Grandpa, so they, they grew, lived around Grandpa, and then the grandkids grew around, the great-grandkids put in a church, and of course everybody's got to have a soccer field, and there goes the best land. Well, that's happening all over Costa Rica. This is the very best agricultural land all over the tropics. Here's the very best tro uh, agricultural land in Costa Rica. This, this is called the Central Valley. This land, it's San, San Jose, and well, it's actually four cities that have four small towns that have emerged into an enormous city of more than a million people. And it's on all of, this is the very best place in the country to grow coffee. And uh, well, not anymore. Uh, now, how do they do all this agriculture? How do they keep up with their population growth? They do it through agrochemicals. Here are people out spraying potatoes with pesticides. Uh, everywhere you go, there are people that are moving bags of uh, chemicals around. Here's some fertilizers. Uh, here's a, a German agrochemical company, Bayer. And they got every kind of side. C I D E means pesticide. It means killer. Pesticide, nematicide, fungicide. And it's just tons of that stuff there. Here's cotton. This used to be sprayed 30 times a year with DDT. Not anymore, but it used to be. Went down off the back and killed all the shrimp in the coastal areas in the Gulf of Nicoya behind there. Pasture.
pastures everywhere. Here's a good pasture. We've got a cow. There's two of them. Here's a typical pasture. Believe me, this is typical. And what this means is that the cows use more energy going up and down looking for their drink of water or their next bite than they uh, gain. And so the cows gain very little weight because they're using so much energy going up and down these steep slopes. This is in the western part of the country, a typical pasture, pasture and pasture, but no, no cows. Doesn't rain much, not much grass grows, but it's still a pasture. Is Monte Verde a famous uh, biological reserve, but <laughs> the whole countryside is, nobody pays any attention to it. All the ecologists go up here, but you know, this is the ecology of the country too. I'm the first person probably to think about it that way. Well, maybe Dan Jansen has. Now, I'm not telling you this is bad. I think it's good. I like agro landscapes. And it's diverse, all kinds of different crops. And you've got bananas, and you've got uh, coffee, you've got uh, some pastures, you've got some, uh, some kind of row crops in there, maybe. Um, I like it. But we've got to face reality. They've got some problems. Uh, you get lots of wonderful food in the markets if you've got any money to buy it. Here's my wife buying some wonderful food. And you can see the deforestation creeping up the side of the hills. It's just, you just watch it. You look out the plane window. So my wife did. She says, quick, give me the camera. And you just see it going like that. <coughs> pollution, horrible, horrible pollution. Once we left San Jose and went to Mexico City, we're walking around Mexico City, and my wife turned to me and she said, gosh, isn't it nice to breathe clean air? I don't think of Costa Rica that way. The rivers are filthy. Once they get out of the mountains, they're beautiful in the mountains. Once they hit a town, they're filthy. And uh, just to take a look at this, uh, to make a dollar's worth of bananas takes 50 cents worth of chemicals that they have to pay for. Now, let's try to synthesize all this. Now, I've tried to put all this together in, in what we call a computer model. And we'll turn on the synthesis here. <coughs> And here we're going to see Costa Rica. That's 41, 42. I'm born in 1943. So there you see the clock ticking. Now take a look. This is the area of undisturbed forest. Now about every 10 years, you'll see the forest area being updated. 53, 54. Meanwhile, in these little graphs around the edge, you see the number of people, the number of cows, how much agricultural land is being used. This is the best land, the next best land, third best land. Total land is about up there. The fertilizer that's being used is more and more, but the efficiency of fertilizer is dropping like a rock. Now, let's take a watch here. There's an up, up, next update of the land. And the United States built a road in there to chase the commies back into Nicaragua, and boom, all the shifting cultivators came in. There goes that forest. So uh, that's the data of the land use change. So we're going to stop it. So what we have is data so far. We're looking at data so far. And incidentally, Look at what I'm trying to do here. I'm trying to take a complex, we talked some in this course about using a systems approach. I'm trying to take a pretty complicated idea and to derive some kind of graphical technology and so anybody can understand it. It's very straightforward. And that's one of the things we have to do about with scientists is trying to communicate these kinds of things. And we can teach any of you who are real hardworking, interested students how to do this yourself for whatever problem you're interested in doing. So, right here, this is the number of people going up to about 3 million uh, by 1990. Uh, the urban land, uh, uh, pasture land on the best land, agricultural land, per, uh, tree crops. Uh, this is the amount of fertilizer used going up and up. And, but the, the coffee production and the grain production show signs already of saturating. This red is the food required for this many people. A green is a computer model of food production in the country. And the black is what we call empirical, or the data on food production. See, the model doesn't do too bad over time. This is the forest area. CO2 released from forest area change. Uh, another look at total land use, urban, grazing, degraded land, agricultural land, and remaining forest gets nibbled in over time. And amount of erosion from pasture and from crops. 
And the amount of money it takes to run the agricultural sector versus what you gain from coffee and bananas. So we're trying to put the economic and the environmental and the whole, the demographic, all this information together simultaneously. So now we're going to run into the future and what I'm saying going into the future is, okay, I'm going to forget about the forest, I'm going to forget about the wonderful birds, I'm going to try to bring food production up to the amount required by the continuously, and in fact exponentially, still apparently growing population. And, and what the model showed already is what we now learn when we look at the statistics, is that Costa Rica is importing a third of their food in this rich agricultural country. Their balance of payments is going to hell, the erosion is increasing, and the forest area is decreasing. They cannot solve the problem, thank you Dr. Bartlett, as long as this continues, as long as the exponential growth increases. Now you can take this model and you can play with it any way you want. You, it, it's set up so that you can put in your own parameters. You don't believe Dr. Hall, you believe in technology, you believe in population control, you believe in whatever. You can program it into this model and run it yourself. That's the idea.